Cool. So uh, yesterday we uh, kind of stopped at the uh, start of emulsion polymerization, explain a little bit what it was, and uh, just to remind you, uh, the last uh, slide from yesterday basically said that you had lots of ingredients in there, and I, I kind of recapped that on the, on the next one. So here at the top, uh, you could see you know, what's, what's in there. If we, if we only look at the emulsion polymerization of styrene for this moment, why? Because it's the easiest system to remember. Uh, then there's a few things, some key ingredients that uh, the guys in the 1930s and 1940s, so Harkins and Smith and Ewart, they just tried that out. So, for example, they had obviously the monomer styrene and they had water as dispersion medium. And um, they did it at uh, kind of 90 degrees Celsius. They used potassium persulfate uh, as initiator and then sodium dodecyl sulfate as surfactant. And they uh, put in some sodium hydrogen carbonate, for example, as buffer. Yeah, so sodium hydrogen carbonate kind of keeps it nicely above pH 5.5. And then, uh, then they start to stir it up, and we saw, you know, yesterday already that uh, you would make very, very small particles that in most cases were sub-micron in size, and that that didn't really fly with polymerizing monomer droplets because they would be bigger than a micron, so something else was going on. So, so one of the things that you can do if you do chemistry, you're always interested in, in how your reactants kind of get consumed. And in a polymerization reaction, you're interested in monomer consumption, which in other words would be equivalent to monomer conversion. So a monomer conversion in a, in a polymer reaction is in, in most cases quite easy to measure because your monomer is a liquid, in this case styrene, and your polymer polystyrene is a solid. So if you would remove all the volatiles, so you get rid of your water and you get rid of your styrene, you're left with polystyrene. So whatever is turned into polystyrene is no longer styrene and you can work out conversion. Yeah? And then you can plot that as a function of time. And that what you typically see is that you'll see a graph that kind of looks like the red curve uh, on the screen. And, uh, and Harkins in the, in the late 1940s, early 1950s, came to the conclusion that by looking at this, there were three interesting areas. First, you know, the first area where, the, where the, basically the rate of reaction goes up, so basically the first derivative of monomer conversion, uh, you know, gets a higher value. And obviously that maybe could relate to a particle formation stage, yeah? And then there was an interval too, and if you look kind of close at that, you can see that the first derivative of this graph so the slope of this curve, um, in a way, has a constant value. That's kind of weird, because suddenly you consume monomer, yeah, and the rate of polymerization, you know, year, year two polymer kinetics would be like Kp times the monomer concentration times the radical concentration. If I consume monomer, monomer concentration drops, so the rate should go down, but it doesn't. It stays the same. So that's quite interesting. And then the last stage of an emulsion polymerization, basically, you know, the process grinds to a halt, and then we'll end up with this polymer latex. So now the question is, what is the mechanism behind this? Can we understand exactly what happens in the system? So from the 19, say, mid-40s to the year 2000-something, people have done lots and lots, hundreds of studies in order to unravel what the mechanism of emulsion polymerization is. The reason being that people will have control of how big the particles are that you make. What kind of monomers can you use? What kind of functional groups can you put on particles? Can you make really complex particles? And a key to that is that you understand the basic process. Because if you don't know what's going on in your reaction pot, then you won't really be able to modify in a constructive way your recipe so that you can make more complex particles. So what we're going to do in this hour is having a closer look on how this now actually works. So, okay, so in our system, when we start, yeah, so we have water, we chuck monomer in there, we add some surfactant in there, and we basically just stir it, yeah, and we add maybe some KPS to initiate later, but initially, you know, we will generate monomer droplets. And then one of the questions that you can ask is, you know, if you want to calculate rates of reactions, you obviously need to know concentration, yeah? So if we would assume that emulsion polymerization, if, if we don't know that we end up with small particles, would be the polymerization of monomer droplets, and obviously we want to know the concentration 
of styrene in the monomer droplets. So I have a droplet of styrene, and the question now is, what is the concentration of styrene in this monomer droplet? So there are four options here. So we're going to have a vote on this. So think about it a little bit. And then uh, four answers possible. So answer one is that the, you know, the concentration is the density of styrene divided by the molar mass of styrene. Answer B would be the molar mass of styrene divided by the product of the volume of the droplet times the density. Or answer C would be the density of styrene divided by the ratio of the molar mass of water and styrene. And answer D would be the density of water times the number of Avogadro divided by the total volume of the styrene droplets. So let's have a vote on this. What do people think? Opinions are massively divided. And a lot of people uh, aim for answer aim for answer B. So answer A, people, it's about 10%. Answer B is about 50-ish percent. Answer C, 25%. And answer D is 11%. So opinions are massively divided on this. So let's, let's, let's rethink this a little bit. Let's have a closer look at this. So imagine that your monomer droplet is your reactor. Yeah? Imagine that's where everything happens. So now let's get rid of all the other ingredients. Let's just have a round bottom flask with styrene in it. What's the concentration of styrene in styrene? So a typical concentration, what, what are the units of concentration if you're a, a chemist? Most cases, concentration is expressed as what? Mole per liter, right? So, uh, so you have to come up with units that are expressed as mole per liter. So uh, the density of styrene is, well, grams per liter in a way, right? The molar mass of styrene is grams per mole. So if I divide the two upon each other, I get mole per liter. So answer A to me looks logical. So answer A is the correct answer. So if you do that, you get a value from approximately nine, a bit lower than nine. You had a density of styrene at room temperature is about 0 0.909. So the molecular weight of styrene is 104.15. Divide the two upon each other, you'll end up with about, you know, 8.99 something uh, moles per liter. So that's the constant bulk concentration of styrene. Now, then the next, um, the next option is, okay, so I have a phase, nine, roughly nine moles per liter of styrene in the droplets. Then obviously I have two other phases, if you think about it. If I add a lot of surfactant, I have my cells, right? Because a bunch of these surfactants would be at the air-water interface. A bunch of surfactants would be absorbed on the reactor wall a little bit, yeah? A bunch of surfactants would stabilize these monomer droplets then obviously there will be surfactant molecular by themselves in the water phase, and everything that's left, if you have even more, it will form micelles. It starts to aggregate. So that's another phase. So now you can ask, or you can ask yourself, how much styrene is there in a micelle? So now, like, say typically an SDS micelle will have about 70 molecules, roughly can vary a bit, say 70 molecules of Sodium dodecyl sulfate form one micelle. Now the question is, what would be the concentration of styrene in these micelles? So actually, we could we could have a we could have a vote on this. So we can basically ask people. So let's do this. Is there more or less styrene? So who thinks there's more styrene in the micelles in moles per liter than in the monomer droplets? Press answer A. And if, if you think it's less, then press answer B. Okay. So it's about 30% uh, says there is more styrene in the micelles 
roughly than there is in a monomer droplet. Think about this, right? So the monomer droplet, in a way, is pure styrene. That's the bulk concentration. There is nothing else in there, yeah? That's nine moles per liter. If you start to poke other molecules in there, yeah, like aliphatic chains, obviously the concentration has to drop, the overall concentration, yeah? So it can never be more. It has to be less in this particular case. So B would be then the correct answer um, on, on, on that last question. So how much is it? Well, if you do these measurements, it's not very easy to do. It's about 1.8 to 2 moles per liter is the concentration of styrene in a micelle. The other question is then how big is this micelle? And we'll come back to this later. And then we've got a third phase. So we have monomer droplets. We have micelles, which are swollen with styrene. And we have a water phase. And obviously, if thermodynamics is right, there is always a bit of styrene that dissolves in the water, and there is always a bit of water that dissolves in the styrene. Always. Even if these two things are not miscible, you know, imagine I have the Atlantic Ocean and I put one molecule of olive oil yeah, in the ocean, it will dissolve. Yeah? If you put a lot in it, as you've seen in Mexico, then it doesn't dissolve although some people think it does. So, uh, but, um, so that's, that's the basic principle. So the question now is how much styrene is in the water phase? And the concentration roughly, again, varies on temperature a bit and how much salt you put in there, it's roughly 3.5 to 4 millimoles per liter. So a tiny bit of styrene in the water, relatively okay amount, 2 moles per liter roughly in the micelles, and 9 moles per liter in the monomer droplets. So that's our starting point. So now the question is, you know, what's going to happen if we add an initiator to this? So this is like the classical scheme that Harkins and Smith and Ewart initially thought of. So they had a, an initiator, which was potassium persulfate, and that breaks, homolytically cleaves, and so you'll have a sulfate radical. This is an SO4 minus group. It's an anion with a radical on it. Yeah, so it's pretty water soluble. So that's in the water. It dances around in the water. Yeah, because it bumps into other molecules. And then what it can do is that occasionally it will bump into a styrene molecule that's dissolved in the water phase. So now suddenly I end up with a sulfate radical and one unit of styrene attached to it. So how many carbon atoms is that that I add then? How many carbon atoms are there in styrene? Eight, yeah, eight. So C8 and the sulfate group starts to look a little bit like C12, right? A little bit like dihydrosulfate. sulfate. So let's add another unit. So now I have two units. And now this oligomer, we call it an oligomer because there's only a few units of styrene added, starts to become a little bit edgy, yeah? Starts to become a bit, I don't know whether I'm water soluble or oil soluble. It starts to become amphiphilic, yeah? So and because it becomes amphiphilic, it can do things. It can either say, I'm going to join this micelle, yeah? And it enters, it's called entry, it, it enters a micelle. So that's option one, yeah? And option two is, okay, I'm in the water phase, and uh, I'm going to enter this monomer droplet, this big monomer droplet. So now the question is, you know, am I entering a monomer droplet that's large, or am, am I going to enter a micelle, which is relatively small? So let's, uh, we talked about this a little bit already, indirectly. So let's, uh, let's see what people, uh, what people think about this one. So there's four options there. So we have particle formation happens through entry in a micelle, A, entry in a monomer droplet is B, C is both, or D is polymer chains only grow in the water phase. So what are the, the, the correct answers? So what are the answers that people think? So how are we going to make particles, assuming we're living in the 1940s? Yeah, so we have the same mindset as Hodkin, Smith, and Hewitt. Um, 
what is the correct answer of all the things that we know thus far. So, okay, so about 17% says answer one, it enters a my cell, and uh, 6% roughly, 10% says enter monomer droplet, and a few people, well, the majority, overwhelming majority, 70% says both, and 3% says polymer chains grow in a water phase. So, okay, so let's, uh, let's go through these four answers. So let's first go through answer D, polymer chains grow in the water phase. Well, if you class a one mer or a two mer and a three mer, so as in one, two, three units as a polymer chain, then obviously you could argue that they start growing in the water phase. Yeah? So this is actually quite an interesting point, because if you would not only use styrene, but have a water soluble co-monomer in there, then potentially you start to make a lot of water soluble type of material. And then the polymer chain could stay in the water phase which unfortunately would be an absolute disaster for an emulsion polymerization process, yeah? Because you start to get this amphiphilic chain in the water phase and it starts to grab everything and it becomes a mess. And worst case scenario, you'll just end up with a macroscopic gel, one giant jelly uh, around your stirrer. Not ideal. So D is definitely not right in case of styrene. Entry into a micelle, um, some people said, um, yeah, well, that was the classical theory, right? So people basically saw that these particles were smaller than the monomer droplets. So for some bizarre reason, that initially seemed to be the only option. Because if you would have entry in a monomer droplet, you'll polymerize a monomer droplet, and you'll end up with something that's larger than a micron. Yeah? So B happens as well, but not a lot. As we've seen on that first SEM picture, you had a lot of small particles and one larger one. The one larger one was probably this one monomer droplet. So it's kind of weird, right? Because if I look, if I want to enter an other phase, I have to go through the interface. And the interface of a sphere, four pi r squared, yeah? Obviously a monomer droplet is way larger than this tiny micelle. So it doesn't really add up. The thing what you have to keep in mind is that the total surface area of these micelles, so that's the surface area of one times its total number of micelles is way larger than the other one, potentially. And that's something we're going to have a closer look at to see, you know, how we can understand that we can make these small particles. So what better to do than just start to have a look at an SES micelle? So here's a picture uh, of a, well, a, schem a schematic picture of an SES micelle. And, uh, and that's something really interesting. We come back to this later um, that can predict how molecules, but also particles, if they self-assemble, what shape the suprastructure, the self-assembled structure will have. And you can do this from a mathematical point of view. Not difficult to understand. So basically that number is called the packing parameter. Packing parameter is described as volume divided by um, a specific area times a specific length. And basically what you do is that you, obviously if this, this micelle here is depicted as a sphere, you put these numbers in as a sphere, and then you do the same thing for the molecule, but we'll come back to that later. Anyway, the packing parameter for a sphere should be a third, yeah? And then um, you can kind of figure out how long a C12 chain is. You can just stretch it, right? Imagine you have, you grab one end of, you've grabbed your sulfate group and you grab the other CH3N group and you just stretch it, yeah? And the maximum length that you're gonna get is expressed by that equation. It's called the fully extended chain length or sometimes it's called the contour length. You just stretch it out fully. And then obviously if, you, if you've done this and you know how big this head group is, you can kind of model it as a cylinder so you can have a similar equation for its volume. So, and that equation is, is, is given on that slide as well. So, uh, so if you know that, you, you can kind of come up with the mean aggregation number. So how many, how many SDS molecules are there in one particular micelle? Yeah? And if you think about that, that's obviously four times pi r squared, with r being the radius of the micelle. And A0 is basically the area the head group occupies 
So the sulfate group occupies on the outer surface of this micelle. Yeah, if you divide those two, you pop all these head groups, then obviously that has to match. And you can do the same thing with the volume. So the volume of a sphere is 4 over 3 pi r to the power 3. And if you divide that by the volume of one of these molecules, then obviously you come up with the same aggregation number. So experiments that, that have been done show that the aggregation number typically is about 74 for SDFs micelles in this particular case. And, and, and because once you've known that, you know how many carbon chains you have, so you can calculate a number for the volume, and you can work out then A0, so you can work out how big a micelle should be. And based, if it would be a sphere, yeah, then R has to be 1.84. So a, a micelle is roughly twice the size of that, so we're talking like 3.6-ish, 3.7 nanometer in diameter. Pretty small, yeah? Remember, however, that our micelles are slightly swollen with water. Now, the clever one under you who had quickly put this in the calculator already will figure out that the maximum contour length is smaller than, this calculate, than, than the calculated value of R, which basically means that in this particular case, the actual micelle is not a sphere it's slightly eggy but let's assume it's a sphere yeah so now let's see about this entry into a monomer droplet versus entry into a entry into a micelle so let's let's just do a quick rough calculation in the head so we'll focus on the same emulsion polymerization that we had 300 grams of styrene in 625 grams of water at 90 degrees kps as an initiator as as a surfactant sodium hydrogen carbonate as buffer so we can calculate the number of micelles per liter of water. Because well, we're just going to assume for the sake of it that every, every molecule forms a, forms a micelle, right? Forget about CMC for the time being. You can correct for that if you want to. But if you don't do that, then you know, just roughly, you'll end up with you know, 4.7 times 10 to the power 20 micelles, roughly. Now, the total surface area, you know then, because we just calculated that the radius was about 1.84. So the total surface area that you're going to come up with is then roughly, you know, 20,000 square meters for all the micelles together. So, and then, you know, let's, let's get this 300 grams of styrene and stir it up. And uh, let's just assume that we can stir it up with, a, with an average radius of 5 microns, which is pretty hard stirring. So 10, 10 microns is the average styrene droplet. Um, the density of styrene was 0 0.9. Then we can obviously work out what, if we assume the monomer droplet is a sphere, roughly, we can work out what the total surface area of that is. And then we end up with 320 square meters. 20,000? square meters versus 320 square meters, yeah? If you undergo phase transfer, I'm a molecule in the water phase, and I have to enter another phase. In most cases, I will go through the interface that's the largest. So in most cases, I will enter a micelle. Sometimes, I will enter a monomer droplet, yeah? So this explains that most of these oligomeric radicals, according to the smith theory, theory would enter a micelle, and that's where the polymerization would start. Yeah? So that formed the nucleation, the micellar nucleation theory, based on Hawkins and Smith and Ewart. So to, to wrap this up, you have a water-soluble initiator fragment. That's a radical depicted as a green dot. And then you add, you know, two monomers of styrene to it, maybe three monomers of styrene to it. This thing starts to become surface active in the water phase. It will enter a micelle. And inside this micelle, this thing will find two moles per liter of styrene, way more than four millimoles. So, you know, obviously, it starts to become longer and longer and longer, you know. And then, an, obviously, another one of these things enters, and then another one, and then another one. And then slowly but surely, this particle just grows, and you'll end up with a a polymer particle, which is a pot noodle of polymer chains, wrapped up in a ball, stabilized by sulfate groups on the initiator, but also stabilized by surfactants. And that would form a critical, quite, quite 
plausible theory on how this particular system worked in the 1940s and the 1950s. So, uh, and then people did lots of kinetics and they came up with all kinds of equations. So this is typically one of them, prediction equation, which basically predicts the total number of particles. It's quite important, the total number of particles, because if you know how much styrene you've got, and if you assume 100% conversion, if you know, or if you can predict the total number of particles, then you know how big they are. And size matters, yeah? If you want to make particles of 100 nanometer, you have to make a certain number of particles if you use a certain amount of styrene. And with these type of kind of semi-empirical equations, you could roughly predict whether that would work. So why are these things? Well, K was a touch factor. If, so it varies a little bit, 0 0.37, 0 0.53, 0 there's a point missing. And then Gilbert, Bob Gilbert in the 19, um, late 70s, 80s, um, 90s even, uh, stated that the value should be 0 0.7. So there's a bit of fluctuation there, which um, accounts for capture efficiency. B times R is the rate of initiation and has a fudge factor in it as well. And then uh, this mu uh, that's divided with is the average growing rate of the particles. And it scales with that roughly to 0 0.4. And then it's multiplied with the specific head group area of the surfactant molecule um, times uh, the concentration of the surfactant to the power 0 0.6. So roughly you could say that the number of particles would scale with initiator concentration to the power 0 0.4 and with surfactant concentration to the power 0 0.6. So how, how, how people use this typically, they run one reaction, they measure the particle size, they go, damn, I've got 200 nanometer, I want 100 nanometer, and they use that equation to either play with the initiator concentration or with the surfactant concentration in order to get it right the next time. Yeah, so that's, that's how you should see this. Okay, so, uh, and then we thought we were done until these guys um, started to do some better and more in-depth kinetic studies on what was actually happening. And this uh, is the mechanism of homogeneous nucleation. And if you think about it, this is kind of a logical way of thinking because, you know, classically, crystallization, for example, you make an organic compound in your lab and you want to recrystallize it, crystallization, in most cases, you do through homogeneous nucleation, right? You have a supersaturated solution and then suddenly you start to form crystals, yeah? You're not going to chuck a lot of dust in it, really, or other molecules in order to assist. Sometimes you do that, but in most cases you don't. So, and, and the homogeneous nucleation theory was, was actually really well developed in the 1940s, 50s by a guy called Lamer. Uh, and he could predict you know, whether you get nice monodispersed crystals or not, or whether it would turn into a mess. And so these guys thought, well, maybe, maybe homogeneous nucleation is also important in an emulsion polymerization. And the most critical case of this was actually the little video clip that I showed you yesterday. There was a polymerization of an acrylate, but we didn't put any surfactant in it. So if we don't put a surfactant in it, there can't be any micelles. And if there are no micelles, what's going to happen then? I still end up with a latex with really small particles. So I still don't get entry in a monomer droplet. So that means that something else must be going on alongside micellar nucleation, or maybe it's even more important than micellar nucleation. So that's where their way of thinking came from. So the first two people were Fitz and Sai that wondered about this. And then later on, Hansen and Ugolstadt developed this further. And then the theory is known as the Huff theory uh, for, you know, kind of homogeneous type of nucleation. So what happens now? Yeah. Again, I start with the sulfate radical in the water phase. It grows, finds one unit of styrene, two units of styrene, starts to become surface active can't really find, well, think about that it has to choose, right? It can find a styrene droplet, but it has to travel through the water to find this. So there's a collision rate, yeah? There's a time dependency for this. The alternative is to bump into another styrene molecule and become slightly longer and longer and longer. So if I can't find this styrene droplet, or if that droplet would be saturated already with other fragments, 
then the only thing I can do is keep on growing, and then I become so hydrophobic that I'm going to collapse on myself. So my polymer chain isn't no longer extended in the water phase because it doesn't like water, so it kind of shrivels up. Yeah. So what I end up with is, in a way, uh, at a certain chain length, which, which fits and I call the J critical, is a polymer blob, that's one growing polymer chain with one sulfate unit attached to it. And you could call that a primary particle. And then that particle could kind of grow into something bigger. That's uh, where they came from. Now, obviously, this theory was developed in stages. And I'll, I'll take you a little bit through the different stages. And it's, it's, quite, it's quite a beautiful little piece of work. And we just do it qualitatively, so we're not going to go through major, massive, difficult equations. So the first uh, point of view was that the variation of the number of particles, so a particle is defined as you know, when this one thing collapses on itself, should be related to the rate of initiation. Yeah, Because if I produce radicals, they start to grow. And then a number of them, when they hit J critical, they form a primary particle. So it should be a function of that. So this would be logical. Yeah. And then B is basically the efficiency of this, because maybe this radical decides to add one unit of styrene and then reacts with another sulfate radical. So I have two sulfate radicals, one unit of styrene. That's water soluble, doesn't do anything. So B is a bit of a, B is a, bit of a, a fudge factor. Now, if this equation would be right, then obviously I start to make every chain will collapse on itself, keep on growing, and, every, and I get lots and lots and lots, more and more and more and more particles. That would mean that if I make particles all the way throughout my process, I can never end up with a latex that all my particles would be exactly the same size. That's impossible. Because the ones that I make after one second will have a way longer growing time than the ones that I make an hour in. Yeah? So you have to add a correction factor to this. And the correction factor is, once I've got a particle, I grow one unit of styrene, two units of styrene, then I become surface active, and this particle that's growing is desperate for sulfate groups because it becomes bigger and it only has one, so it can enter that particle. It doesn't make a new particle, it joins the, an already existing particle. So it's a correction factor. That's what they did. So I added this correction factor, which they called capturing or entry in a way. Yeah? And then what you would get is that if you would plot the, the concentration of particles as a function of time, you would get a graph like this. Now, and this was predictable for a number of experiments, even for experiments with soap. If you, if you, especially, you know, if you kept the soap concentration below the CMC, you don't have my cells, then this would work really beautifully. Until they did a bunch of experiments that this equation wouldn't fit there was an other thing that potentially played a role. So imagine I have a relatively low initiator flux, as in I don't produce many radicals. So I've got this thing growing. I collapse on myself. I grow pretty fast because, you know, I'm going to swell up, and there's more and more monomer inside. I'm growing and growing and growing, become bigger, and there's only one sulfate group, and occasionally another one joins, but I don't have enough. Yeah? What do I do? I group together with a bunch of particles until my area to volume is low enough that I could sustain my colloidal stability. I have enough surface charge to then remain stable. So there's an extra term on top of this to account for this, which was maybe some coagulation happens in this. So, and that was basically worked out further by Hansen and Ugelstad. And later on, the mechanism for this was coined a coagulative nucleation, coagulative homogeneous nucleation, by Napper and Gilbert at Sydney University in the 1970s. Yeah? So now you have two mechanisms for radical, well, for particle formation. So this describes stage one. Yeah? So this is the picture, the end result, what you would get in this case. The total number of particles, you make a lot, yeah? But they don't have enough surface charge density, and therefore they self, you could say, self-assemble or coagulate. 
a bunch of them grouped together, and then you have enough, yeah? Because your area to volume is corrected for that, and then you end up in a stage that that coagulation stage uh, stops, and then you'll end up with a stable set of particles. And that's the end of your particle formation stage. And if your particle formation period is short compared to your total polymerization period, all your particles will be exactly the same size. Yeah? So you'll end up with a monodispersed particle size distribution. 